really pleased to be here. It's a great room. I'm just pleased at the space that we've been given today. And I was reminded when we drove up the, uh, uh, so I divide my time between Des Moines, Iowa, and Portland, Maine. Uh, and in Des Moines, and I'll talk about this a little bit because it's relevant to court watching. Uh, in Des Moines, um, very actively engaged in this experiment of creating sort of an intersection between restorative justice and community organizing. And uh, so court watching was a product of that experiment. And we did our first court watch training two years ago, January, three years ago, January, in at First Presbyterian Church in Des Moines. Church very much structurally like this and just as welcome. welcome. So, uh, it feels good to, good to be here and talking about court watching. And uh, we're also going to talk some about restorative justice. In my opinion, uh, they're inextricably tied. When we talk about uh, restorative justice, we talk about the need for there to be a paradigm shift, right? Uh, uh, from uh, responding to crime with punishment, uh, to a shift where our response is not one of punishment, but of repair, of harm. And I would suggest uh, the reason to spend a little bit of time talking about restorative justice before getting into the specifics of court watching is that when we court watch, hopefully you're using a reparative lens uh, through which you observe the proceedings and uh, observe and then begin to ask questions. Uh, about a lot of why questions. Why is this happening? Why are these folks here? Et cetera. So, uh, yes. Uh, I'm from Jackson. We have a Jackson contingent here, and we're interested in this kind of work. So we're here to observe and see what Washington County is doing. Yeah. And I wonder how a prosecutor got involved in restorative justice. <laughs> I can talk about that. <laughs> First of all, I never thought I'd be a prosecutor. <laughs> I read Clarence Darrow's book, uh, Attorney for the Damned, when I was 10, and I thought, I really thought that was the only kind of lawyer that there is, you know, the people that represent the disenfranchised, the, the poor, and the people who don't have a voice. You know. And um, somewhere along the way, um, I went to law school. Um, not immediately after undergraduate work, I traveled, as a lot of young people do, and owned a bike shop, drove an ambulance, uh, news director of a radio station and a number of things, but my wife finally said, uh, if we're going to have five kids, I didn't know we are going to have five kids. She said, <laughs> she said if you're going to have five kids, you're going to have to get a real job. Right. Well, I thought, you know, news director in the morning, bike shop in the afternoon was pretty real. <laughs> anyway, uh, she had different designs, and so I went to law school and did work for the Iowa Attorney General's office for about a year, and then was recruited by the local county attorney to come work for him. And uh, back then in the 80s, it's sort of interesting, I won't digress too much, back in the 80s, it wasn't thought that you would be a career prosecutor. There were, there were very few. Most people that went to work for a prosecutor's office wanted to get trial experience uh, for two or three years and then move on and be a litigator you know, in, in some kind of a general practice. Uh, I, would, I would think that if you look at your prosecutor's office, uh, you have people that uh, are career prosecutors. And uh, uh, you can argue for or against that. <laughs> it's hard to get rid of career prosecutors. And I won't say any more about this. <laughs> um, so anyway, I was one of the two or three year people. I was a felony drug prosecutor and white collar crime prosecutor. And that's when I began to think. I didn't know about restorative justice yet. It was around, been around since eight or ten years, I found out later, um, uh, starting with a program in Elkhart, Indiana. In fact, I met, you know, met some people from Goshen, uh, which is near Elkhart, and uh, Howard Zare, uh, the godfather, grandfather of restorative justice, uh, was from Indiana, and I think went to school at Goshen. So it was a real strong Indiana uh, connection with the roots of restorative justice in this country. But in 85, 86, I didn't know about that. Um, uh, but what I did know was that 
I, was free, I would frequently talk to victims of crimes who would want the offender, the person who caused them harm, to go to prison. Uh, and uh, they, had, uh, they had legitimate reasons. They'd been harmed in a significant way. Uh, their life had been changed by what had happened to them. And uh, as a culture, for the most part, uh, I think that we thought that that was the, the only real legitimate response to serious wrongdoing was incarceration in prison. And, but I would find, I would run into victims, they would call me three, four months, a year later, and uh, we would have a conversation. They'd want to know what was happening with the person, you know, where are they, and, and, uh, and they would, in one way or another, um, uh, share with me that what they thought that they wanted wasn't what they really wanted. That the, that, that, that the criminal justice system response, which was consistent with what they wanted, hadn't given them what they, what they hoped to get. Some kind of satisfaction, some sense of safety, uh, whatever. And uh, um, I didn't really know what to do with that. Uh, I myself felt uneasy about people going to prison and rarely asked for prison, uh, except in the most serious cases. Uh, but, but to begin to hear victims saying, this isn't what I thought that I wanted, uh, really had, uh, had gave me pause, okay? Uh, so after the, you know, the requisite two and a half years as a litigator, I went on to do work with legal aid, and I had a criminal practice taught at the law school. But in 90, 1990, I was asked to return to the same prosecutor's office, this is in Des Moines, Iowa, Polk County, which is about the size of your county. And at that time it had 30 prosecutors, uh, has 50 some now, uh, although there's not been that kind of increase in crime. You know. It's interesting, so many levels to trace, you know, what's happening with the crime rate and compare that with um, prosecution rates, conviction rates, etc find that they don't track with each other very well. But um, I was asked to come back and be the bureau chief of the criminal bureau. And one of my, I had two sort of somewhat inconsistent jobs actually. One was to oversee the Polk County Neighborhood Mediation Center. And the other was to oversee the, the screening and filing of all criminal cases in the office. Okay, So it was uh, somewhat paradoxical. And, quite frankly, a challenge to, to balance those two roles of overseeing a peacemaking making group <coughs> comprised primarily of, of uh, community mediators and having to make charging decisions and decide what to do with all the cases that came into the office. Uh, and I was six months into that job, and I'll never forget it. I've mentioned this to uh, some other people. Uh, there's some people here that heard me speak to this, but I, it's important for me anyway. I've been in that job for about six months, and I was talking with my wife about quitting because I found myself at the top of a machine, right? Uh, uh, you know, pushing the buttons, pulling the levers, and there was no, um, there was no meaning in it. It was just a, it was a machine. It, it didn't appear to, certainly didn't have a heart, and in a sense, didn't even have a head, you know. I was at the head of it within my office, but I wasn't at the head of the criminal justice system. There was nobody really at the head of it, you know. And uh, it just is this mindless thing. I hate to say it has a life of its own, but it has an existence that you really can't, it's even hard to point a finger at it, you know, and say, who's at fault for the brokenness, you know. Um, so I, we were talking and, you know, well, how would I, Time I had five kids, and how would I, how would we feed them, <laughs> and all that? And fortunately, she was a nurse, and so many people have survived because of nurse spouses. <laughs> I found that out over the years. Uh, and we decided I would quit. And lo and behold, I get a letter in the mail from a minister friend of mine, a Presbyterian minister, Bob Cook, and he, uh, I worked with him on homeless issues when I was at Legal Aid in the eighties. And he said, Fred, you've got to find out about this thing called restorative justice. And, uh, and then he went on to tell me a little bit about it. 
And then he included, he included in the letter the keynote address from the 1990 Ontario Canada Annual Restorative Justice Conference. Well, it turns out the restorative justice got started pretty much in Kitchener, Ontario back in the mid 70s. And what I remember from that, uh, from that keynote address especially, is the, is the um, individual who wrote it and presented, said, we will have a restorative justice system in 100 years. And, uh, and I thought, wow, that's, number one, uh, um, we can have another kind of justice. Okay, that's one thing, that's a message. One message was we can have a different kind of justice than, than the one that I was seeing that didn't work. And number two, uh, oh, 100 years, well, sort of takes the pressure off. I know I won't be around. <laughs> so, uh, and I was just absolutely intrigued by it. And there were other things in the letter and in the, in the, in the presentation that really resonated with me. I never liked being a prosecutor anyway. And, uh, uh, but then I, I made the connection between, you said, we'll have a restorative justice system. That means that we'll continue to have a system of some kind, right? We will have a system because there will always be wrongdoing and there will always be victims of wrongdoing and there will be people who, who cause the wrongdoing and, um, and there will be responses and that will all take place in some kind of system uh, that probably won't look like the one that we had in the 90s or that we have now. And so I started doing research on, on this thing and uh, I was thinking a little while back, you know, how did you do research in 1991 without Google, right? But I tracked down uh, and found out about the, the roots of restorative justice, first in Canada and then in Indiana, and then I found uh, about this man by the name of Howard Zare, who you alluded to, who in 1989 uh, published a book called Changing Lenses, 1990. He just came out with the 25th anniversary edition uh, in June. If you haven't read it, <laughs> I'm not here. Actually, I do endorse it. I'm on the inside cover of it, so I, but I get no royalties. So I, I, uh, I would say if you have not read Changing Lenses, you have to. It's like you know, if you're a Christian, you have to have at some point opened the Bible. You know, if you're going to say that you are an advocate for restorative justice, you have to have read Changing Lenses. You know, it's the seminal book, the the Bible in the, in the sense of the movement. In fact, I teach a class now in Maine to at-risk kids, and it's our textbook. We're using it for the entire year. It's a wonderful way to, to take it apart week by week. Um, uh, but anyway, what uh, Howard says in Changing Lenses is that we have to have this paradigm shift. He says we are looking uh, and have looked at wrongdoing in our communities uh, for a long time in this country. We've looked at wrongdoing through a punishment lens, and uh, and it's not worked. Okay, and that was 25 years ago. We know about a lot more now than we did then about it, to the extent to which it doesn't work. And he said we, we need to look at wrongdoing through a reparative lens. Okay, and the focus needs to shift from punishment to repair of harm. And uh, so this might be a, a good time to look at this slide and just compare the two. You know, so. If we're looking through a punishment lens at wrongdoing, um, what, we, what do we see? We see that crime is a violation of the law and the state, right? So what happens if, if you're the victim of a burglary? And Jimmy Smith, um, you know, Jimmy Smith is the person allegedly who committed the burglary, and the police arrest and file papers, and the county attorney comes along and files more papers, and in a sense, there is a lawsuit. It's not called a lawsuit in the criminal area, but in fact, it is a lawsuit. You've been brought into the system. And uh, I'll just ask anybody, sorry about this time coming in, but I'll ask anybody, how is that captioned, that lawsuit? Uh, it, it's who against who? Oh, the state versus the Yeah, it's the state of Michigan versus the offender. And where is the victim in that plea? Nowhere. What's that? Nowhere. Nowhere. Uh, actually, they'll be somewhere. They'll be down there in fine print as a witness. Okay. Uh, I won't even say victim, probably. It'll just say, it'll say witness. So, when we look at wrongdoing through a punishment lens, we will see that 
crime is a violation of the state, okay? And that that violation ultimately creates guilt. Whether it's personal guilt, ultimately, the system doesn't really care if, if the person who commits the offense feels guilty or not, but they want to impose guilt. The system wants to impose guilt. Okay, and so what does justice require? It requires the state to determine the blame. Who did it, okay? And impose pain punishment. And central focus is on the offender, the offenders. Right? And uh, as I think it's Howard or somebody else early on, they call this system the trail them, nail them, and jail them system, right? Trail them, nail them, and jail them. And just think of the number of years that we've watched television shows and movies in which that was the central theme of it. Something happens, now we kick in. The state, with all of its resources, kicks in first to track them down. Who did it, right? So you trail them, and then you nail them through the arrest and then through the prosecution, and then ultimately through a finding of guilt. That's what the state hopes. And then the jail part, the punishment part. So that's, that's a paradigm uh, that I would suggest most of us grew up with. Uh, if you didn't grow up with that paradigm, raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, is, that is our culture, that is our history, you know, in this country. Trail and nail and jail. You know, restorative justice, um, doesn't say we don't we don't hold people accountable for what they did. Doesn't say that uh, we're going to be soft on crime, um, but it but it but it shifts the focus and and says that crime is really a violation of people and relationships. And I didn't get that at first. This idea that crime creates relationships. Have you heard that expression before? Crime creates relationships. What does that mean? Um, well, I got it uh, a month after I read Changing Lenses in the early summer of 1991. I was in Chicago with my five children. We're going to a Chicago Cubs game, and we got robbed on the L. Okay? And um, three of my five kids were old enough to really have an understanding of what happened. And to this day, they are in relationship with the person who robbed us. Okay? They still remember that. It took, it took less than a minute, and they still remember it. And those people, that person still lives in them in some respect. Well, that's a relationship, even though the person was never, ever caught. You know? So I get it that crime creates a relationship. So what do you do with that? Okay? What do you do with that? The fact, this, the, the fact that is a fact that creates relationship. Okay? And violation creates obligation, okay? Um, that's different than violation requires punishment. Violation creates an obligation. You do a harm, you have to rectify it, okay? And, um, uh, you know, for those of you who think, uh, well, there's a lot of ways to think about this. I think quite a bit about, you know, our punishment system is really a very passive system, right? You know, you now, there's not much required of you, particularly if you're incarcerated, right? It's, uh, I do work in prisons, and the overwhelming experience that anybody that's spent any time in jail for prisons is boredom. You, don't, you just don't do it with, with, you know, interspersing violence, right? But for the most part, the predominant experience in a prison is boredom, and that's a very passive experience. And if you think, you think and I'm not a psychologist by any means, but if you think about agency, you know, there, there is no agency, right, when you're incarcerated. You know, there's no experience of agency when you're, when you're passive. Um, but when you shift, this is a fascinating thing, and I don't think there's been much written about this, but I find it fascinating to think about when you shift from punishment and its passivity to obligation and its requirement for action, then you begin to see why restorative justice is meaningful not only to victims, but to the offender, because the offender has to take action, has to fulfill an obligation, and in the fulfilling of that obligation, experiences agency, and therefore meaning in the, in the aftermath of having committed a harm. I think it's a fascinating and a very real phenomenon that takes place that we don't generally talk about when we talk about restorative justice. 
And so justice, if we're talking about the real parties to the offense, it involves the victim, the offender, and the community. Okay? Because the, the community is also affected, depending on, depending on the crime. And, uh, and, and to the extent that we focus now on crime in our media, uh, we're, we're all affected when there is a crime in our community. When, when, what do you feel when you watch the, the nightly news and there is a OWI, a drunk driving, that results in a death? Does that affect you? Does that do anything to you in a visceral way? Right? And you think, well, oh my God, thank God that wasn't us, my family, my kids, and uh, you know what, I'm probably not going to drive at night. It's late because you know that happened at one in the morning, or you know, and or when there's a burglary in the neighborhood and you find out about it, how does that make you feel? Right? You're affected by it, even though there is no loss to you, you know. And um, so that's why the community is an important piece, whether directly or in a support way. The community is is essential, and that's why this is essential. The community is involved in the response to wrongdoing in our community. And what's the central focus? Uh, victim needs and offender responsibility for repairing harm. And um, I'll give you one example. Before I ever knew that there was restorative justice, and I mentioned this yesterday when we met with, what, five or six judges. And uh, so when I was uh, prosecuted the first time in 1985, 1986, uh, I organized a group of uh, government lawyers to do pro bono work. And it was sort of thought at the time that Oh, when you're a government lawyer, you don't have to do pro bono work because you work for the government. Well, that's crap. It was just a cop out. And um, so I organized a group. We initially, were called GARP, <laughs> the Government Attorneys Resisting Poverty, but the Attorney General didn't like that for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> great, and and uh, so we changed it to GAP, Government Attorneys Pro Bono. And, uh, and it was during the Iowa farmer predator <coughs> crisis. And there was a call for mediators because we had so many farm, farms, farmers going under. And so we recruited lawyers to be volunteer mediators and Drake University Law School um, had a three-day mediation training. And uh, uh, almost all of it having to do with the mechanics of mediation in a civil context. But there was a one-hour session on the use of mediation in criminal cases. And uh, I'll never forget it, and that's why can share with you now. Uh, so I'm absolutely intrigued. I'm a prosecutor and there's this break, this session on mediation in criminal cases. And what, what, what do you mediate in a criminal case? You know, I was intrigued by it. And there's something that said there's something to this. I don't know what. So I, I went to the session and it wasn't a session. There was nobody there other than somebody running a projector uh, and introduced this film. It was a black and white film and all it was was a, a small room, and there's a woman in her 30s and a young boy in the back of somebody who I assumed was the mediator. And um, the woman is telling the story of when, and telling the story to the boy, not just telling it to a journalist, but telling it to the boy across the table, about this far, <coughs> and um, she's talking about what it was like to come home after taking her three little girls to a movie find the house in disarray, and, and then finding things missing, okay? And she's talking about the losses. But she then she looks at the boy and she says, but those losses, those are replaceable, you know? The real loss to me and my girls was our, was our loss of safety. The world isn't the same for us anymore. And you've stolen this from us. What, what you took was not the items, you, you stole from us our loss of safety. And uh, she said, uh, my girls can't sleep in their own beds any longer. They have to sleep with me. They wake up at night. Uh, the least sound will wake them up. We don't go out at night like we used to. We started to install an alarm system. And we uh, had to change our locks, etc. And uh, it was fascinating. I don't know, it wasn't necessarily professionally done, but it was fascinating. You could see the impact of her words on the boy. And you could see, at least it appeared to me, that he had never ever thought about this. Okay. And he later said, I never thought about this. He said, 
I thought, you know, I went into a house, I did some things, and I know I shouldn't have done it, but uh, I assumed insurance would cover it. And I never thought about the things that were telling me. And he started crying. Okay. And then you could see the effect of his emotional <coughs> response on, on the mother. And it was magic. <laughs> you know. and, uh, uh, and I didn't know what to do with that. I didn't know, just like I didn't know what to do with victims who were dissatisfied with prison, a few months after prison was closed, I didn't know what to do with this. Because it, I didn't know there was another paradigm. I didn't know about this paradigm shift. But I did witness in, in this film that there are needs that a victim has that our system doesn't address. Okay, our adversarial system does not allow the telling of a story in this way by the victim. At the very best, at the very most, I'm not going to call it best is the wrong word. The very most, that story may get told if there is a trial. The trials happen in roughly 2% of cases. Okay? And of those 2% of cases, I would suggest less than half of them involve the victim. So, I don't think I'm going out on a limb to say that less than 1% of criminal cases in this country result in a trial in which there is a victim who testifies. So how often does the victim story <coughs> told? Okay. And is that victim story told to the person who caused the harm, or is it told to a jury? All right. And is it scripted somewhat? And is it bound by rules of evidence and rules of criminal procedure? Absolutely. So it does not happen. It is so rare in our way of doing justice, that the very thing that victims need is, is not allowed to happen, okay? Uh, unless you have a restorative process that allows the telling of that story across the table to the person who caused you the harm. And when does it ever happen in our way of doing justice that the person who caused the harm really feels the impact of their, of their actions? Maybe it's when they're in prison. I communicate by email regularly with a young man in prison, at a federal prison in West Virginia. And now about two years into his sentence, he's beginning to think about what he did. Uh, but it doesn't, our system is not designed to respond to the, to the real needs, and the central focus, the victim needs, okay? Nor to the offender needs. That boy in that film ended up expressing to the extent that he could with words, but much more so with his body and his tears remorse for what he did. Okay. Doesn't happen. You know, I mean, I was a prosecutor for 23 years. I can assure you that outside of a, a restorative process that I was fortunate to be a witness to or facilitate, I did not see it happen. Maybe it's different in this county. Maybe somehow it... It works I've yet, yet to find a criminal justice system uh, that meets those needs in the day-to-day -day churning out of justice. Okay. So anyway, fast forward to 1991. I read Howard Zier's book. Uh, we have 25 regular mediators in our Polk County Neighborhood Mediation Center. Pull them together, at a meeting, show them the book, and I said, what do you think? Will you read this? We ordered 25 copies, we read it, and then we, we got Mark Umbright, who was a colleague of Howard Zeres in Indiana, who's now uh, Dr. Mark Umbright at the University of Minnesota at the School of Social Work. And, uh, but he came down to one and did a three-day victim offender mediation training um, for us. And uh, it was called victim offender mediation then. We don't use that word so much anymore, mediation in this context. And we just started doing victim offender mediations in our system. And you know, I could spend the morning talking about that whole 15 year journey of creating a restorative justice center within the middle of the criminal justice system. Uh, getting local commissioners, we call them board of supervisors, to fund it at about $400,000 a year uh, to actually create restorative justice positions within a prosecutor's office to actually fund on an annual line item basis uh, stipends for trained people in the community to facilitate a victim offender uh, And how all that changed 
did not change the system. And that's sort of the cautionary tale in all this. It did not change the system. I think it changed lives individually. Uh, and we did many of those. We did roughly we developed the capacity to do year in and year out about 1,000 <coughs> victim offender meetings. Uh, anything from shoplift to homicide, uh, sexual assault, armed robbery, burglary, car theft, uh, assault, you name it. We we had a philosophy, or yes? How did you decide what went into that type of resolution? If the victim wanted to do it, we tried to make it happen. Yeah. yeah. And so we, we part, of, part of the work of the center was to have non-lawyers uh, trained as restorative justice specialists and trained in having restorative conversations by telephone with victims to let them know this is a process that's available to you and what, how it might benefit you as a victim. But here is an opportunity for you to tell your story and to be with the person who caused you harm. Okay? Let that person know. And uh, uh, I, you know, I did not know. I had intuitively, I thought that victims, some victims would have this need, but I did not know until time went on how frequent, how much victims have that need. And just just one example, at a, at a very serious level, um, at one point in time, by 1996 or 97, judges were ordering it. Okay, it, it began getting into the normal sentencing orders, and. Uh, um, so the crime of sexual assault, rape, okay? The victim would be offered that. So did not have to. There was never any pressure on the victim uh, to, to meet the offense. The victim would be offered it. And um, I remember a half a dozen cases at least in which it was uh, offered and, and turned down. Why would I do that? Why would I ever want to be with a stone's throw of the person who changed my life that night. Right? And, um, and uh, at least a half a dozen times, I got a call, or one of my staff would get a call a year later, five years later. The offender's in prison, and the victim would say, I need to, I need to do this thing that you told me about a few years ago. I've been there, got into counseling, it's been helpful. But I need to tell him what he did to me. And, uh, and we brought back from prison. And they had a, a very safe room. Uh, that conversation would take place. And, uh, 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 and they are, we use the word here, they were, it was, it's almost a religious experience to be, have the honor of witnessing that kind of, uh, that experience, that storytelling in which, uh, yeah. So, um, so to answer your question, um, it was always, always available to the victim. The, the standard sentencing order, and some people will disagree with this, but I don't. Standard sentencing order would say, if there is restitution in this case, then the offender shall meet with the victim in a victim offender mediation if the victim wants to, uh, to discuss restitution and to discuss the impact of the crime on the victim. Okay. So that was the standard language. Uh, but what in fact happened was all of that <laughs> and, and a discussion about the offender and where he's coming from and what was going on with him. You know, what was he thinking? What was his day like leading up to that? These are all questions that victims have. Because they have the question, they have the same question. The why question. You know, why me? Why then? Why the way you did it? And the police can't answer those questions. That's the other thing. You know, the police can tell you how something happened. Right? You know, they, they're, they're there afterward. You know, they can, they, they have the forensic, the results of forensic testing and all this. And they can tell you the how, but they can't tell you the why. And even in homicide cases, or surviving family members have the why questions. It can only be answered by the person who killed their loved one. A couple questions. My, my question is about the offender. Yeah. Once it is sentenced, do they have the right to say no other one? 
or is it part of the sentencing? It's actually part of the sentencing. And but there there is a it's not an easy thing. Right? You can imagine it's not an easy thing. I would frequently talk uh, given permission by attorneys to talk to their clients in jail about this process. And they would say, their, their initial response might be, uh, I, you know, I'd rather stay in jail. I can't do that thing. <laughs> because doing that thing means taking responsibility, okay? meeting an obligation. And it's easier to sit in the jail cell and do nothing than to accept the responsibility of hearing the story. You know. Uh, and, but we, our people were really well trained, and if it appeared that it was really inappropriate, you know, then the court would be informed. Okay. But this not, but, but that was pretty, that was pretty rare. And I will tell you that, that most people who commit a harm that results in criminal charges and conviction, they want to do the right thing. They may not know how to do the right thing, but they want to do the right. They're human beings, right? They're human beings. They feel bad about what they did. They, they want, they've never, they've never been allowed to say, I'm sorry for what I did. So here's the one opportunity they're given to say, I'm sorry. You know, because our system doesn't want for that. Is there any difference between doing it immediately and doing it five years later when the offenders had a chance to grow up? Sit for a while and calm down? Yeah, that's part of it. Yeah, that is part of it. And when you, when you, uh, the, the, the homicide ones I did, uh, I think I did three or four before the offender went to prison. It's usually about a year process on a first degree murder between arrest and imprisonment. You know? And we did those, I think I did two of them the day before they went back. Uh, but I did a couple of others after they went to prison. And when you look around the country at states, that have actually formalized prison uh, victim offender meetings. Uh, and ironically, Texas, which kills more people than any state, also has the most victim offender meetings annually within, within, within inside prisons. And, and it's a long process of preparation for both victims and, and offenders. Uh, the the timing-wise, uh, every, every situation is different. Some victims are ready, some victims are not. You know, and, uh, and you honor that. They're not ready. If they never do it, they never do it. Uh, if they can't do it now, just keep us in mind. Call us if you find that you need to have that need. We'll talk again. I was thinking that some offenders might not be ready. Some offenders are not ready. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's probably true on, on most of the more serious offenses. Yeah. Um, uh, but we developed, um, I think, a respect for the process among the defense bar, particularly among public defenders, who, who would work with their clients as well and encourage them to do it. And it was interesting to see the development of uh, many of the public defenders where they, it was meaningful for them, for their clients, to participate and accept responsibility. You know, so that, it was interesting to see that shift for them, even as much as they're trained to protect their client and never say a word, you know, when they would sit in and see, see the efficacy of this, they would really encourage it. Yes? If the victim wants to meet with the offender, and the offender says no, what happens then? Well, it just, I mean, usually it's not, to do it? usually it's, yeah, that's what I'm saying, yeah. it was ordered. Yeah. It was they ordered. have to do it. Yeah, they have to do it. But if it's determined that they're really not ready or that they might in some way re-victimize, mm -hmm. uh, then it wouldn't happen, you know, or that they're not ready. And we would get input, not only from our staff, but from their lawyers, you know. Well, then my follow-up question yeah. is, has anyone studied, and I think this would be a very interesting thing. Sure. To study. So they're quote, not ready or whatever. Well, you're going to do it, you're going to hear the hear with the victim society anyway. So the victim tapes what they, how they feel, what they, the questions they want to answer, and the offender has no choice but to listen to that. They don't have to do. So then they have something to think about while they're in the cell. Yeah. I think that'd be a very interesting thing to study to see how many of them then say, "Gee, I really want 
to answer those questions. And I didn't know about all these effects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good point. Yeah. Certainly, and I've not, I've not seen that. I mean, I've seen frequently victims will have questions, and we will, they'll write them out, and, and we'll pass them on to their attorney so that the, the attorney can share with his client what the questions are. And I've not seen the video. I've seen the video apologies by offenders that were made available to victims if they want to watch it. Yeah. It may increase the what the uh, offender, uh, bring out things in the offender they didn't know sure. was there. Yeah. But that's what the process does too. You yeah. stick right. with the process. I mean, you have to have faith in the process. And I will tell you that the research shows that the satisfaction rate for both victims and offenders is greater than 90 percent after having gone through. It's extremely high, much higher than, than you would think with other sanctions, for example. Yeah. Okay. Can the meetings result in the change in the sentencing of the offender? It can. It can. Not, not always, but it can. I mean, you, you know, if there is a murder, you're probably not going to change that sentence. Okay? But I can think of several. And, and my preference was on the adult level. All of, so far, we're just talking about adult crimes, not juveniles. It's a whole somewhat different thing, right? But, uh, with adults, my preference was to have the victim offender meeting take place after the guilty plea, but before the sentence. Okay. Uh, for a number of reasons. Number one, that empowered the victim. Okay. It's meaningful. There's my, what, what happens in this meeting and the agreement that I might come to with the offender is going to go to the judge and be considered by the judge at the time of sentencing. That, that's far better than if the judge at the time of sentence says, okay, I'm going to give you a a two-year probation, you got a thousand dollar fine, you got community service, so, oh by the way, you got to meet with the victim. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's just an, it can be an add-on. And the victim can feel somewhat dismissed by the system because here it is, oh you've already sentenced him, do you really care about what happened? <laughs> so um, far away the, 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 the preference is to have it before the court makes its final decision on the outcome, right? Good question. Yes, somebody had a question. So, um, so that's that, and so I want to I want to quickly get into what what we've learned, what I've learned, and, and when when sitting in on these and seeing that victims, uh, many on the more serious offenses who have wanted incarceration before the meeting, where they are at the end of the meeting, and I was talking about this recently, and I cannot. Recall, I absolutely cannot recall after either facilitating or observing hundreds of these sessions that a victim who wanted prison at the outset wanted prison at the end. Okay. Uh, so they experienced their own shift, okay? Because now suddenly the person who did this is not, as some people will say, sometimes not the boogeyman. <laughs> you know, I've had people say, now I go home and tell my kids, I tell my wife that you're not the boogeyman. You're not the other. You're not this terrible thing. You know, you're a human being. You have needs. You have wants, uh, etc. And so, almost always, the conversation gets to uh, what what can be done so you don't do this again. Okay? Is it treatment? Is it education? Is it mentoring? You know, what is it? You know, how can we put together a meaningful response? So that you're less likely to hurt somebody else in the future, you know? and uh, you know our politicians don't know that. Right? They we're told they make the assumption we're made to believe that people will only feel safe if people are locked up, and quite frankly, that is not the case. When you have a victim offender, some kind of restorative process, and, and where the victims end up uh, later on. Or, what, what's the percentage of the work? Um, you know, I really don't know what it is for adults. I do know what it is for juveniles because that's most of my focus these days. But the for juveniles, the recidivism rate for juveniles who do not go through a recidivism process is between 35 and 40 percent. Okay. If they go through a restorative process, it's less than 10 percent. Okay. And then there's a second phenomenon that I think is equally fascinating. I mentioned this to the judges yesterday. 
that those who go through a restorative process, even if they reoffend, the crime, the delinquent act that they commit later on, is almost always less intrusive than the one that got them into the restorative process. So for an example, uh, if a kid is committing burglaries, finally gets caught, meets the victim of their burglary. If they, if they do reoffend, and less than 10% of them do, but if they do reoffend, they're not likely to commit a burglary again. They're, they're probably going to commit a shot. You know. And that makes sense if you think about it. Because suddenly, when they're in the process, they suddenly see, I've hurt another human being. When I break into somebody's house, even if they aren't there, I've changed the lives of those occupants. But when you shoplift from Kmart, you probably don't have quite the same feeling, you know. And I personally think that's somewhat of a success, you know. If, you know, we're, we're not, you're not going to cure. We would never say that successful participation in a restorative process means there will never be any crimes committed. You just can't say that. And you find any program that does that, other than the death penalty, right? Find anything. Anything that works where you have a recidivism rate of less than 10 percent. Well, that's why you have to advocate for the county attorney to utilize restorative processes in the adult criminal system. But you have to collect the data for But the problem is, is prosecutors are risk averse and they don't let this happen if you don't let The overwhelming amount of research is on juveniles. Not all of it, but the overwhelming amount. I mean, our office, quite frankly, was the exception in the United States where we incorporate within the formal criminal justice system these processes. You won't find that very many places. And where you find a lot of it is, is the work being done in prisons, okay, with people on death row, or people in prison for life without parole. Well, those, you're not gonna get, get statistics out of that, right? You know, the point is, is we need to step up to the plate and make this available across the country to victims who have been offended by adults, not just victims who have been offended by juveniles. Yes? Uh, there's Judge Connors. Yes, I meant Judge Connors. Yeah. So that's the only... But he's working with juveniles. Right. Yeah. Yeah. right, but but it was the juvenile court that I was watching as part of this group yeah. before Judge Connors got there, and oh my gosh. You would have thought that this county was almost entirely African American. You would have thought it by watching that court. Absolutely. And then you would have thought that marijuana was absolutely the worst drug in the whole world <laughs> because they would send one after the other, you would watch being sent to 30 days in jail because, and, and one young woman, I can never forget her saying to the judge, I did not use, I tell you, I did not use jail. Yeah. Uh, and uh, who knows, maybe she was close. How can you have a, always uh, have it be right? But I know so many people my age who use marijuana all the time. <laughs> Do you think that they're being put for 30 days? How many of us have children who use it all the time in their dorm rooms, right? Or because wherever. they're not African Americans. They're not African Americans. And the police don't police the college campuses. They police the poor neighborhoods, right? They stop people in older cars with taillights out. Right? And, and they stop people loitering, so to speak. And we all know what happened in New York City with stop and frisk. You know, and and if you break the curfew in certain parts of this county, yeah. then you can get caught up in a system that's going to end up with you owing $3,000. So, I appreciate bringing that up, and when we get to the court watching piece, which I think is probably pretty soon, um, we'll, we will talk more about that, and because you, you, you are absolutely talking about why we need to do what perhaps many of you are called to do. Um, yes? Who um, takes the role of the victim when a crime is um, something like use of drugs or something where there isn't, where society is the victim, or the community as a whole is the victim rather than a single individual as an employer. Oh, you know, that, well, that's a good question. I mean, you, uh, within the prisons, many states have victim impact panels, okay? And uh, some progressive correctional systems will have uh, 
don't have a victim impact course. Um, as I said, I used to work in prison in Maine, and when I go back in a few weeks, I'll be teaching a restorative, restorative justice chapter of that victim impact course. And then later on, they will bring in three or four uh, volunteers who have been victims of crime to meet with the class. So uh, that's probably the most obvious um, uh, scenario where there are surrogate, where there are surrogate victims. Uh, one of the programs that I help run uh, in Des Moines with our community uh, mediators, facilitators, is with the Des Moines Police Department. And uh, they send us um, some serious, they don't send us felony, but they'll send us assault cases and property damage cases. And they also send us uh, shoplift cases. And sometimes the store will send store security. And uh, they do a very good job with young people. Uh, but sometimes the store has no interest in that. So we'll find a local business person. We have a small group of local business person who sit in as the surrogate victim, and, uh, and it's effective. You know, it's, it's good. So that's a, that's a that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. So what, one point I wanted to, to make, that is sort of a segue to court watching, is um, it may not be an obvious connection, uh, but when you when you participate uh, in these meetings, and uh, we're not. Uh, I'm not talking specifically about the circle process that many of you may know, or be, which I'm a huge fan of as well. Um, but I will say that in our county, we didn't, um, we focused more on victim offender meetings, and the more intimate, the more intimate meeting rather than the larger circle, just because if you're going to develop a system to capacity, if, if you believe and if, if you assert that every victim has the right. It's very difficult in a, in a community of any size to develop the capacity, at least in the short term, to have a circle, have a thousand circles a year. Okay. Uh, they're time intensive. Just, in, just, just as you can imagine, all the calls you have to make and the scheduling all that. So, uh, uh, so what I'm talking about comes from my experience facilitating victim offender dialogues or conferences and not circles, although most of my work these days, quite frankly, is doing circle work whether it's in schools or churches or whatever. But within the criminal justice system, if, if you are going to really, over a period of time, build the capacity to meet the needs of victims and offenders with a restorative response, you're going to have to develop the capacity. The, 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 you're going to have to, yeah, develop the capacity. You're going to have to have uh, enough trained people to do the dialogue work. That's, that's my opinion. Okay. They're both... They're both important tools for restorative justice. It's just that the smaller, more intimate victim dialogue allows you to do many more. It's just that simple. Um, but anyway, so in, in doing this work, what, what you, and I've already alluded to this, where victims, I've never seen a victim want incarceration at the end of a victim offender meeting. And what you begin to learn is, is, is that the people that come together uh, both victims and offenders are very creative in their developing a response to what happened. Much more creative than, than our justice system, which tends to be a cookie cutter justice system, right? You know, we have um, sentencing guidelines on the federal level, we have mandatory minimums, uh, three strikes and you're out, all those things that are, that are filling our prisons. And it's a rubber stamp kind of justice, right? Um, but, when you have victims and offenders get together and they come up <coughs> with a meaningful response that they want the court to accept, uh, generally it's very, it's very creative. And uh, uh, I mean, I've seen teachers who were victims of a crime and the requirement was the boy be mentored by the teacher so many hours, <laughs> you know, or, or, uh, or do a particular community service that's, that's very meaningful or there's just all kinds of things. I, um, I, I wrote a book called The Justice Diary, in which I spent a, about a year and a half talking to about people about their experience with the system. And the very first entry is about a case that I prosecuted, which two neo-Nazis uh, did considerable damage to a synagogue. And we ended up having a, an evening-long restorative meeting. It, wasn't, it was sort of a quasi-conference circle because of so many people. 
Um, but what they found out about the offenders, particularly the boy who had just turned 18, was that he'd been the victim of physical and emotional abuse by a stepfather who ran away from home, ended up at a school for neo-Nazis in Alabama, came back to Iowa to sort of uh, do an action, recruited a young girl, his girlfriend, they did this damage, but he had a, he had a um, hearing uh, deficiency which resulted in a speech impediment which caused him to be bullied by stepfather and kids at school. So one of the requirements out of that meeting was that the boy go to an audiologist, which the synagogue agreed to pay for. Yeah. yeah. And another requirement was that the boy and the girl do 100 hours of community service uh, with the groundskeeper at the synagogue, but also do 100 hours of classroom time with the rabbi on a weekly basis studying Jewish and Holocaust history. And, uh, so that's the kind of creativity that can come out when the real people involved in a wrongdoing come together in fashion justice. Okay, and you don't find um, every once in a while you find a victim over the top. Okay, uh, in terms of like the monetary amount lost, and and you have to delicately sort of test that, you know, and get it down, get it get it to something that's reasonable. Because what we know is. If you impose a sanction uh, that's unreasonable, normally nothing is done. Whereas if it's a reasonable sanction, the chances of it getting followed through on is extremely high. So, so what we found out, though, was that uh, as a result of doing this work, we began to look at all kinds of pieces of the system. And I mentioned to the judges yesterday, that we started, uh, among many things, we, we looked at license under suspension cases. We found out that in our county, 20,000 people have their licenses suspended at any one time. And to make a long story short, we approached the Department of Transportation and convinced them that if we could come up with payment plans uh, for these people, and they, they would get their license back while they were paying on their fines, rather than getting their license back when all the fines are paid off. Okay. There's a big difference between the two, because if it takes you three years to pay off your fines, during that whole time, you don't have you don't have car insurance, and you're probably going to get arrested again and then again and again. But if you could be paying on your fines and uh, and have your license at the same time, we're all the better off. You know, you have your insurance, you're being responsible, you feel good about it, you can drive, etc. And I just bring that up as just one example of several for you to keep in mind as a court watcher, so that. Once you are in and you're watching things and you begin to ask questions, you begin to ask, you ask the why question. And you also ask the what if, the what if questions. Why couldn't it be this way? What if we did it this way? And so you, you, you ask the question, the questions originally arise in you as a result of what you're watching in this particular case. But then you begin to step back and look at it systemically. Okay. Okay, so uh, another program that really bothered me was how we treated first offense drunk driving, okay? And um, uh, most of the time people went to jail for two days, okay? And I said, well, that's a waste of two days. Why can't they go to some educational program for two days? And so we took about a year to put in place, but we we developed a response to first offense drunk driving that they would go to a college campus for a weekend and get really a well done Sunday night, Saturday, Monday night, no, Saturday, Friday night to Sunday night educational program around you know, the appropriate use of alcohol on their lives. Okay? <laughs> so that reduced jail overcrowding. It required the offender to be accountable. Okay, they had to pay for the class fee. Well, it was, it was reasonable. It was a couple hundred dollars for two nights, all the meals, the education materials, and everything. So they had to pay $200, but yet they weren't in jail. It wasn't a waste of time. And we saw drunk driving rates go down as a result of that shift from incarceration to accountability. Okay. Um, uh, I, uh, my mother was on welfare when I was a kid. My dad left when we were young, so he's not welfare. So I particularly fond place in my heart for uh, 
uh, women particularly who are on welfare. So I hated it when the state would send us big stacks of welfare fraud cases to prosecute. Mm -hmm. And I finally said, enough's enough, I'm not going to charge these women with felonies anymore. I said, if you're going to send them to me, you only send me cases that are at the felony level, and I'm going to reduce those to misdemeanors if they, if they go through a program. And what we did was uh, they would send me 20 at a time, and I would send 20 letters out and say, listen, we got this referral from the State Department of Inspection and Appeals. They want to charge you, they want us to prosecute you for at the felony level for committing um, Medicaid fraud or whatever. And we want to give you an opportunity to address that, to be accountable. And here's the, here's the deal. If you come into our office, you know, a week from Tuesday, we'll have public defenders there to talk with you. And if you find you want to do this program, here's what it is. You, two weeks later, you'll go to, and we have rotating churches who would sponsor this. And two weeks later, you will go to uh, such and such a church, and you'll have a class from 9 to 5, and it'll address domestic abuse, uh, landlord-tenant issues, financial responsibility, balancing your checkbook, uh, and basically it was a life skills class. So they go to the basement of a church, they, the church, five churches would come together, provide a free lunch, and at the end of the day, the judge would come and take their guilty plea to a misdemeanor. They never even had to go to the courthouse. Okay? Uh, they sat down with the state, worked out reasonable payment plans, and so these women who committed welfare fraud because of the pittance they got, uh, ended up not having a felony, ended up getting misdemeanors. Uh, their cases were over in four weeks instead of six months. And um, even their misdemeanors were wiped off their record if they finished their one year probation. Okay? And um, I bring that up, I bring these examples up because the way we do business is not the only way to do business. Okay, and we talk a lot about mass incarceration, and it is the most serious problem we have within the correctional community. But for every person who goes to prison, another 99 people are run through the justice machinery, right? And have, and they're labeled, and they're given obligations that are over the top, and their needs aren't being addressed, okay? So, I bring these up again, so that when you're court watching, whether it's on the juvenile level or on the adult level, and you're beginning to understand the system, who the players are, what the procedures are, etc., and you're asking questions about this boy or this girl, and then you began asking questions about this group of boys or this group of girls, and how do we handle, how can we, how can we push for systemic responses that make sense and call for accountability? So, um, so it's a process. <laughs> Uh, to go through. Yes. Have you written a book or a pamphlet, something like that, that uh, we can purchase or get a hold of? To well, <laughs> I, I mentioned this earlier. I, I, I didn't as, as my last class in the graduate work I was doing on conflict transformation, Howard Zayer, the godfather of sure justice, was my advisor, and we agreed that I would write a book. Uh, on my sort of year and a half experience driving around the country talking to people about the justice system. So uh, this book, The Justice Diary, Inquiring the Justice in America, uh, I'll, I'll leave cards up here. The books are too heavy to carry. Um, but I'll leave cards. It's pretty cheap on Amazon.